demigods welcome back to retired fangirls my name is megan and today is an oops all megan episode um i reread the sea of monsters a while back and apparently i had quite a lot of thoughts i'm getting around to editing the footage and just started compiling my thoughts and throwing them all together for you guys so i hope you enjoy this very special episode of me talking to you about my favorite book series that i haven't read in damn near a decade so see you on the other side um, I'll film a real intro later, but I feel like rereading The Sea of Monsters, so I'm gonna get started on that. Maybe I'll do it the same way I did The Lightning Thief, but I don't know, because it's already late, so. Mm. I love this child so much. That's it. He just, like, he reminds me of Peter Parker. He reminds me of the kids that I wanted to be. I mean, obviously I read these books when I was a kid. This framing is so wild. You guys are getting such like a, a room tour. Um, the Percy is just like such a genuine good person and like being friends with Tyson and sticking up for him even though it made his life hell. Like he's so brave for that, honestly. And then I just read a part where um, he's like, I'm not gonna take my anger out on mortals. Um, if only Sloane knew who I was. That was like the thought and it made me really think of him being a superhero, which like I guess he kind of is and having this secret identity. Just really love him, really proud of him at 13. So the monsters that crashed Percy's school um, to like kill him in dodgeball or whatever, they said they were from Detroit, which made me giggle a good giggle. <laughs> um, I cannot pronounce Last Dragonians. That is my best attempt. <laughs> And about calling them Canadians. This book is full of jokes. I forget how funny these books are until I read them again. I'm reading these now. I'm just reading this scene now. They're in the they're in the taxi booking it through New York. Now that I like live here, I know exactly where they are. They're about to go over the bridge that is like two blocks away from my house. <laughs> and it's just like a different experience because all of that info felt so frivolous when I was a kid. It's like kind of you know the paragraphs that you skip when you're reading but now i'm like oh, where are they should i do this route should i go see what they're doing they're like flying over buildings <laughs> and i'm like hmm, broom and mott what a fun road <laughs> okay the other thing about reading these books now at 23 um rather than the last time i read them all the way through is probably high school right before blood of olympus came out um is now i have like studied greek mythology i've read a lot of the classics i've read most of the stories they're talking about i know the backstory and a lot of the myths um a lot better than especially when i read them the first time i had no idea who tantalus was dionysus like i i hadn't heard these stories before so now it's like really interesting to go back and to read um and to actually understand all of the illusions and like the work that rick riordan put into this to like hear the story after you know, the trials of Heracles or um, the the Odyssey home or, you know, the war at Troy. Like, it's crazy, like, how well he knows his shit. <laughs> and, like, to be able to read that and actually appreciate it and to understand that, you know, this was the foundation for my education and it's the reason I love the classics and it's the reason why, you know, I've, I've loved a lot of the books that we've read in school because they're modeled off of, you know, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Aeneid. Um, I feel really lucky that the books that introduced me to reading um, are books that are so intimately entwined with some of the greatest pieces of literature ever written. Um, and I feel lucky that I have that background to like actually appreciate it. He's kind of a genius writing middle grade fiction and I love him for that. He's real for that. So Hermes just appeared for the first time and it made me come to the painful realization that I am like in love with this character, like in everything that I read. In the Percy books, in Circe by Madeline Miller, in Odyssey and Iliad, whenever that god appears in literature, I love it. I eat it up and I like, you know, if, if I had to pick one god to smash, I like based on all of the evidence, I think that me personally, I'd be a Hermes girl. And I hate to admit it, but I did need you guys to hear that confession. Me editing, and I recorded this well before they announced the casting. Maybe I'd still bang Lin-Manuel, who knows? But 
as of right now, rethinking my choices. I think one thing that I appreciate about the Percy Jackson the Olympians series more than the Heroes of Olympus series is that villain, like Luke as a villain, is way more sympathetic than Gaia. Like, you can understand where he's coming from and I think that that's the hallmark of a great villain. Like Thanos was a good villain because you could see like, you see where he's wrong but you understand his argument. It's not just like this overarching evil, which I guess has its like place, but um, I just really appreciate Luke far more than the villains in the Heroes of Olympus series because it's just like, it's more human. Like I get it. I see where he's coming from, you know, like, all of that but that was my brain right now after reading his chapter on the princess andromeda which I, I apparently forgot the plot of this whole book besides like they go to the bermuda triangle and save grover that i forgot everything else about it i'm waiting for clarice to show up again on her quest but everything else has been new to me so apparently it's been a while right so the sea of monsters is just the odyssey right except he doesn't meet Calypso until the Battle of the Labyrinth. <laughs> I didn't even connect those dots when I read the Odyssey for the first time, but I think that's because I haven't read this book in a long time. Um, my deep dark confession is it's my least favorite of the original five, which I feel like it's a fair ranking out of those five books. Perceive Monsters to be at the bottom. Um, after the reread, I'm sure I'll have a better understanding of how the full ranking is but sea of monsters was definitely my least favorite so yeah it's wild how it's literally just the odyssey without calypso <laughs> at the end of sea of monsters percy says i'm just a kid gyron what good is one lousy hero against something like Kronos? he's a baby he's 13 He's in middle school. This is gonna be brutal to watch. I don't know if I can do the show. <laughs> Just finished, definitely need to collect my thoughts and then I can give like a better review, but it's good. Definitely not the best that I remember. We'll see as I reread. Um, but I liked it. A lot of the pain in this book it doesn't hurt as bad when you know how it ends. Like, Tyson's death doesn't hit as hard, and um, you know everyone makes it back because I've read the whole series, I know how the series ends. Um, but I did cry when they introduced Beckendorf, and then he mentioned Selena once, and that also tugged at my heart because I love them a lot. Um, and then Luke saying that he has a spy at camp was also really hard to hear. So that's where I'm at right now after literally just closing the book. But we'll chat again once I gather my thoughts and that'll be the intro outro all of that. So thanks. Okay, I finished The Sea of Monsters honestly a really long time ago. Um, and I've taken some time to collect my thoughts, to write some stuff down, write some stuff out. Um, I have finished The Titan's Curse in this time. So I'll probably be filming that recap soon. Hopefully I get that video out to you guys if you care. Um, sometime in the near future. But for now, we are talking about the Sea of Monsters, and I have things written out. So I think that this book is so closely tied to the Odyssey, and I know I already talked about this in the video, but it's really interesting to me how that comes out and how I didn't realize it until that reread of this book. Like I've read the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Aeneid, so many different iterations of each of those, like Circe or the Lost Books of the Odyssey. Um, and it's interesting that now is the time that I realized that this book is the Odyssey. Um, like it's almost a fanfic, which is so funny to me. Um, this reread was really interesting. Um, and since I have the first three done, it's definitely my least favorite of the three. I don't know what my favorite is yet. We'll talk about that at the end when I finish all five. Um, but I just like, you know, over halfway through the series, I think it's so interesting that dreams are such a core motif in them. I'm still parsing out what 
I'm thinking about them when I think that motif like symbolizes and pulls out and we'll we'll get there eventually um but I think they're such an interesting addition to the story that the Greek like Odyssey Iliad um don't really touch on as much and it's such a great introduction and especially since these are kids like pulling that in and diving into their psyche in that way um even though they are usually divine omens is so interesting to see play out in this space and then pulling tantalus's story into this book is wild to me because that story is so dark like he bakes his children into a pie or into a stew one of the two and then he tries to feed it to the gods and like goes to tartarus and cannot eat or drink anything ever again and it's so interesting that rick decided to include him in these series and i guess like all myths are pretty dark but that one's especially is like wild to me as an inclusion and why did he choose him for this role and to be the cruelty of not sending percy on the quest and sending clarice instead and all of these different you know like bad things that are happening at camp while chiron is gone is very interesting to dissect and learn about um and then i think it's really interesting that clarice gets the quest um her characterization across the series in my opinion so closely resembles that of achilles um and i think it's really cool how all of the characters are sort of put up against like um annabeth being odysseus we'll talk about that more later and percy being named after perseus but really going through a lot of the stuff that heracles did clarice being characterized as achilles to contrast what i see as percy and annabeth together being odysseus in this book and her being you know the strongest the best of the greeks and for some reason you know getting the quest and the, the confederate soldiers which i'm very intrigued to see how that goes in the show um it's interesting to see her start to be set up as that especially with what happens in the books and to see um selena's only briefly mentioned in this book but like her start to be set up as the patrocles to clarice's um achilles is something that i'm just going to be chewing on until i finish um and then i also just like so deeply love and appreciate the bond between grover and percy and i think i was really missing that in the heroes of olympus book percy and grover's relationship to me are the core of the book series the core and the heart of what's going on like yes of course i love percy and annabeth together yes of course they're beautiful and cute and i want them in every scene that they have but you know it was very intentional to choose to give the empathy link to these boys and to have them be best friends and have grover find percy and like succeed where he failed with talia and have those relationships and that relationship actually to be the core of the series like the first five books yes it has all of it yes it's percy's relationship to himself and to the gods but especially these first two books are his relationship to grover and saving him and it's like similar in the battle of the labyrinth like it's just so important to have these boys together and to have them love each other and have an empathy link and like be empathetic and care about each other and he's weaving a dress like all of these more feminine traits are pulled out of both of them when they're together and i really love and appreciate like letting boys be emotional and have feelings and feel empathy and also love and care about their friends in a deep and real way um and for friends that they don't end up dating ever like he ends up dating annabeth their friendship is beautiful but like it's just a different growth and i love having that as a core for this book um and now into the greek parallels um i'm gonna start keeping a running list of the labors of heracles that percy accomplishes so he fights the hydra and the stymphalian birds don't know how to pronounce that and then they fight two bulls at the beginning they call them cretan bulls i think no cretan bulls are the real trial or the cretan bull is and they fight colchis bulls i'm counting them as one right now until i'm proven wrong just to like complete the trials um so so far by my count he has three but i do have to comb through the lightning thief again and see if there are any more and then i will add the ones that he accomplishes in the um titan's curse when we do that debrief 
And then if we're looking at the Odyssey, as I said earlier, this book is literally the Odyssey without Calypso, like beat for beat. Um, all of the major plot points in this book, the last Dragonian giants, the Lotus Eaters, which are actually in the Lightning Thief, but like that is a major plot point of the Odyssey and it's a place where he gets trapped when he's leaving the Iliad for the first time. So think Percy going on his first quest or coming home, getting stuck in the Lotus Casino, very similar to Odysseus and his crew getting, you know, just like lost in time with these Lotus Eaters. Um, and then he fights the last Dragonian giants at the beginning of this book. Obviously he goes through Charybdis and Scylla, just like Odyssey does when he's escaping Circe, which they both escape. Um, he has the leather bag of wind. Odysseus gets it from Aulis, uh, however you pronounce it, the god of wind. Um, and Percy obviously gets it from Hermes. They go through the sirens and um, Odysseus posts wax in his ears to, or his crew puts wax in their ears and Odysseus is tied to the mast um, so that he can hear what the sirens say and Annabeth does that exact thing in this book so she's like taking on that mantle um, and then obviously the culmination of this book in the battle with Polyphemus and the nobody situation and you know telling him their names of curses happen in Tartarus like all of those beat for beat are the plot points of the Odyssey Calypso and the Lotus Eaters obviously happen in different books, but you know, they're all together. Um, and it's out of order. It's not in the same order as the Odyssey, but like that's where the interest comes in. You can't just put them through the same thing. And I think this is really cool um, to look at just for the characterization of Percy and Annabeth. Um, I do think that throughout the series, Annabeth takes on more that mantle of Odysseus and is like the clever, the quick, the battle, Athena's favorite. She's obviously a child of Athena. Like there's all of that going on. Um, but in this book, I think Percy and Annabeth together are the character of Odysseus and that homecoming um, that, you know, Kleos, the Greek like glory and homecoming that the Odyssey is so rich with um, and instead of getting to Ithaca and that being their goal and they just want to get home after 10 years their goal is to find the fleece but also to save their friend um, and to find Grover and like this home for Percy which is why I think that their relationship is so core and central to these novels like his homecoming his Odyssey is going to find his friend um, and I think that these two characters together, the wise brain, or the wise girl and the seaweed brain, um, balance themselves out with each other because they're still so young in this book, still figuring out who they are and who they want to be. Um, so they're really balancing each other out and Annabeth having this like wiseness, this wit, this plan and like being so clever in a lot of cases, but um, Percy has like, that loyalty but also the warrior like we learn that he is great with a sword just naturally and Annabeth fights with a dagger and not to say she's not a great fighter because obviously she is but Percy just covers that you know reputation of Odysseus of him being a great warrior as well as like this witty clever man um and I think that the golden trio like they are all stronger together and the books are stronger when all three of them are together um and their characters now like they're coming of age in these novels and percy especially like you hear it in his narration he's changing so much um and their coming of age is together through these quests through these trials through these things that they might know the story of um but this is like putting it into a new context for them but then especially for us like these stories, these myths, all of them, whether we know it or not, are such a core basis for Western culture. So if you're growing up in the United States, in Western Europe, in, you know, Canada, like, we all are built on this, on the Hellenistic culture that came from these myths and stories. And I think the Percy Jackson series is such an interesting way to interact with it um, and to see these kids like Percy is so genuine and kind and loving and has the true heart of a hero and to see him thrown 
into these situations that we see Achilles, Odysseus, Heracles, Perseus, like we see all of these people go through as well and see Percy come out on the other side completely different, partly because of the time he was raised, like it's a different time, the people he's surrounded with, but also he is a different representation of a hero and our culture has changed and matured that we're taking these classical ideas of a hero and a hero's journey and what they are and look like and do and morphing it into something that is more representative now and that's even like a bigger conversation with the casting for the show and having a woman of color be Annabeth and Percy be this blonde boy and a man of color be Grover like it's expanding and including more in the stories and the definitions because our culture is expanding more um and so watching Percy go through these things that we see Hercules go through and Hercules is like notoriously an asshole like the Disney characterization does not align with a lot of the characterization in his myths and stories um of like the time so to see Percy come out on the other side not as dickish not as you know hungry for immortality or glory as um Heracles is I think speaks a little bit to our culture because we're not as glory focused like glory was such a big thing in the Greek culture and we have our different ways of loving and accepting it but it's less about fighting and strength and masculine energy um and more about something else that I think we're still defining and we're still trying to come to terms with what we want and how feminine is a hero how masculine how do we embrace all the facets of our humanity and be truest to ourselves? which I think is something that these books like talk about or brush past a lot is like you are a hero in your form and you see that with Selena you know a daughter of Aphrodite through and through but she still like fights and is a hero or later Piper's characterization like there's so much that grows and changes um, and I think having this book as a direct parallel to the Odyssey just highlights how much is so different between now and then, but also how much is so similar. Because we're still talking about a boy fighting monsters and saving his friends and like the heroism is still, you know, in defeating these monsters and coming home. It's the goal that's different in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that that also, you know, that characterization is really interesting to bring on with Clarice, who's seen as um, a bully and strong and like, you know, this great Greek warrior. And Achilles is characterized definitely as dickish, um, but to have it be a woman who's like a bully and a bit of a villain, but starts to have like a different arc, especially starting in this book and carrying on throughout, um, is a really interesting allusion to how our characters grow and change, how our definitions of heroes grow and change, and then also like how the best can grow and change because if this is not a series focused around Clarice. It is focused around Percy Jackson, who for all intents and purposes is far weaker than her and just like different. Um, and it's really interesting to see these kind of dynamics start to play out and to watch these characters find their footing in the novel and to watch us find our footing in how we want to like read it and the lenses we end up coming out with. Um, so that is my soapbox of Percy Jackson being a generational defining <laughs> um, book series about what it means to be a hero. But I just think that it is so interesting and integral to who we are as people um, and I cannot wait to see how everything grows and morphs and changes as I get into the Battle of the Labyrinth and um, the <laughs> last Olympian. And then also as I dive in a little deeper into um, the Titan's Curse to think a little harder about it and to wonder what it means for me, what it means that it was my favorite book. And um, then also to come out on the other side with a silly little ranking of how I felt about the books and hopefully you know three more videos for you guys to watch and i hope that this wasn't boring and you enjoyed it 
um, always open for conversation and dialogue. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about, you know, these books and what you are taking away from them, what you think, you know, they say about our culture or as a greater whole. Um, so please tell me what you think, um, interact and yeah, hopefully keep coming back. Regular podcast, uh, will resume the next time that we record it. So 